This sermon is titled How to Mentor, Coach and Nurture People Part 2 Be enriched as you listen Alright, are you ready to spend some time in God's Word? Last week we started talking about mentoring, coaching and nurturing people So that's our journey We're just talking about how to do this, how to create a culture, an environment in the church community where we can mentor, coach, and nurture people in, in, in several areas, whether it's in the spiritual journey or as well as in practical things, how we can do that. So last Sunday, we focused on creating a culture, bringing out from the Word of God that this is important, that God wants to see it happen among His people. We emphasize that in the Bible, God is selling, you know, older people give into the lives of the younger people. And you pour into their lives, you, you give into their lives. And also discipleship is just an old word for what we commonly call today as mentoring. The Bible word is discipleship. You disciple people. And it's a process through which we go through and, and helps build people up and help them develop. So what we're going to do today is we, today we're going to talk about how to mentor, coach, and nurture people. How to do this. And we will look at it from the Word of God. Now, of course, we want this to be applied, used in our own context as a church community. But a lot of these things, you can take it back to your workplace. You can apply the same things in your workplace. If, you know, if you're a team leader, you're a project manager, if whatever you're doing, you know, in that context, you can apply a lot of these things and, uh, and use them there as well. Uh, although our intent primarily is, our focus primarily is to talk about in the church context. So today we're going to talk about how to mentor, coach, and nurture people. Next Sunday we'll have a break. It's a Supernatural Sunday, so the message will be geared towards that. The first two Sundays in May, we'll do part three and four, where we talk about guidelines and pitfalls. Uh, as we practice this, what are some areas we need to be careful about? And then we'll talk also, also talk about the positive outcomes of mentoring. So, I want to bring our attention as we start off by just uh, bring our attention to the Lord Jesus and His disciples. Now, we know that when Jesus ministered, He had huge crowds coming. Thousands of people, hundreds, thousands of people coming and listening to Him, hearing Him and being ministered by Him. And, but He had only 12 disciples. He discipled, he mentored, if you want to use that word. He mentored, he nurtured, he discipled just 12 people. And so we can, very, we can look at that process by which Jesus discipled these 12 and we can create a simple framework. And I've put it down in these seven points, which I will mention now and we'll come back to a little later in this message. Uh, number one, there was selection. So Jesus selected 12 people, right? He didn't say, hey, let's... Whoever wants to come, come. The whole crowd would have come. But he selected 12 people. He said, you are going to be people that I'm going to work with. So there's a selection happening. Number two, we see that he gave them opportunity. He said, 12 of you, you come and you get to actually be with me. So for three, three and a half years, these people were very with Jesus. They moved around with Jesus. Uh, they probably stayed in the same home Slept around the same area. They journeyed with him everywhere for three, three and a half years. So he created this opportunity for them to come alongside and to be nurtured. Number three, we see that there were clearly stated objectives. And you can see this in the Gospels. He said, you're going to be with me. I'm going to teach you how to minister. And I'm going to send you out to do the ministry. So this was not three years of vacation. No, this was three years of training. You're going to be with me, and I'm going to train you how to go out there and minister. So the objectives were very clear when he called them in. And before we see that, then there was this mentoring thing happening for three years. He gave them the opportunity to ask questions. He would rebuke them, or he would correct them. He would teach them. Then he would, you know, get them to do things. And they were observing him. Every move he made, they were watching. Everything he spoke, they were listening. So there was this whole mentoring happening 
during these three and a half years. So he gave them that opportunity. Number five, we see that there was delegation. There came a time when he said, okay, I'm going to send you guys out two by two. You're going to go into every city that I want to go myself, but I'm sending you. You go, you do the work, you preach the gospel, and you come back and report to me. And so that happened. There was delegation happening. Number six, we see that there was a challenge he gave them. There came a point when he said, I'm going to go away. But I want you to take this gospel to all the world. I want you to go forth. And you are going to do greater things than me. And you can imagine being one of the 12. And Jesus saying, you guys are going to do greater things than me. So Jesus, this is great enough. You, know? <laughs> you want me to do bigger than this? Yeah, I want you to do greater things than what I've done. And I'm going to en enable you to do that. And finally, we see number seven, he commissioned them. His final words were, go. Go and make disciples. You're on your own now, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to empower you, but now you go. So there was a commissioning. There was a release, or there was a sending out into whatever they were called to do. So we see this, uh, uh, you know, this simple process or this framework that I want, to, uh, uh, I want us to think about today. And that something that you and I can use in working with people, how you and I mentor and nurture people. We will come back to these seven key points of this framework. But what I want to emphasize at the very beginning is that mentoring or nurturing or coaching is a life-to-life -life thing. So everybody say life-to-life. -life. Okay, this is so important. It's a life-to-life -life process. That means if we are discipling people, discipleship happens life-to-life. -life. That means I am pouring out of my life, whatever God has put in me, I am pouring out to you. It's a life-to-life -life thing. So it's not just, you know, an instructional thing. You sit, you attend my lectures. No. The instruction is one part of it. But more importantly, it's a life-to-life -life thing. And so if you and I are going to engage in this process of nurturing, discipling, raising up other people, the place to start is with yourself. You. Because you and I have to live this out first. People need to see this in our lives. And the Apostle Paul, whom we will be pointing to later on in this message as, a, as, a, as an example, as a model in this mentoring process, it's so, it's so clearly evident in his life that he chose to live it first before he could invite people to follow him. Look at these scriptures. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Paul writes this. Let's read it out. What did Paul say? Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now think of it. Hey guys, do what I'm doing. <laughs> just follow me. Follow my example. Imitate me. Because I am imitating Christ. Now, Paul did confess in another place where he said, you know, I haven't arrived. I'm not perfected. I've, I've not attained yet. I'm still in the process. But my position is very clear, Christ. My imitation, my position is I'm an imitator of Christ. I'm going to try and replicate Christ in everything, every way possible in my life. And therefore, he could turn around to people and say, imitate me. Follow me. Imitate me. Because I am imitating Christ. And so you and I, especially in this church context, as you and I set out to mentor other people, disciple other people, let's, let's you know, embrace this for ourselves, that we are going to be imitators of Christ. Our standard is Jesus Christ. I'm going to live like Him, so that then I can then turn around to other people and say, hey, come follow me, imitate me, because I am choosing to imitate Christ. To the Philippians, Paul said this, he said, let's read it out. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk or who also walk like this as you have us for a pattern. Notice the words, example, pattern. Paul is saying, brothers, you can model after me. You can follow my example. You can follow my pattern. Now, that's, that's something big. It's not easy to say that. You know, to tell people, hey, follow me. Use me as an example. I mean, just imagine if you and I came to a place where 
If somebody wants to make a decision in their minds, and I'm not trying to elevate you and me, I'm just saying this as a practical example, they just have to think, what would so-and-so do? Or I've seen so-and-so handle a similar situation. How did they behave? And in their minds, they have a pattern. They have an example. They have a model. And then they can use that to make a similar decision. Are you with me? So this is so important in us setting out to be uh, a people who can mentor, nurture other people, that we hold ourselves accountable to be a model, an example, a pattern. In Philippians 3.17, the same verse from the Passion Translation, Paul uses the word model. We modeled before you the life we modeled before you. In Philippians 4.9, he says, the things which you learned and received, heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. See, notice he says, heard and saw. You heard but you also saw it. You heard me talk about it, and you saw me live it. Says, says, do that. Whatever you heard and seen in me, you do. Just follow. So, as we think about mentoring, let's work. Let's the work, let work start with us. Let's begin to do it. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus emphasized this. He says, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. Notice what he says. Whoever does and teaches. Doing precedes teaching. You do it, you teach it. Do it, teach it. Apply it into your own life. Practice it. You learn the nuances of how it works in real life. So you've got the truth. You've also got the practical experience. Now you can impart that. Now I remember when I was in college, and this might be a little funny, but uh, when I was in college, and we started this student fellowship. I'm talking about money, Paul, in the engineering college days. And, uh, you know, the student fellowship kept growing. Now I handed it off. I went off to the U.S. And of course, one of the problems when you're running student fellowship is this big issue of boy-girl relationship, you know, dating and all that. Now I'm going back in time now, like several decades ago, uh, that those days dating was still looked upon as, you're not supposed to be doing that, okay? Things have changed these days, but I'm talking about way back in time. And so, you know, as a, as a student leader, you had, you had to manage this. And I myself was not dating, but I have to advise others on how do you date, what do you not do. And I remember this happened, you know, uh, uh, so uh, which year was this? I think it was 92, I think, or 93. I, I remember I was in New Jersey at this time, and I was on a typewriter. No, we didn't have, uh, I mean, we still hadn't fully moved to computers then. And uh, I was, I, I wrote, I sat on my typewriter for like two or three days, non-stop typing out, and I typed out a booklet. It was called The Boy-Girl Question. <laughs> and it was setting out all the guidelines for the student fellowship back in Manipal. Guys, I know, because the leaders reached out to me. They said, you know, we're having this problem. All this dating problem is going on. And what do we do? How do we handle this? How, what do we tell them? You know, all the, all the young people in college and were part of this fellowship. And so I, I remember typing this whole thing out. Here and there, I'd use a white White from Viter, you know, if you make mistakes, but you have to make sure you type without making mistakes. Otherwise, you know, the whole sheet goes. And I remember doing that. And now I couldn't speak necessarily from experience, but in that was a con situation where I said, look, uh, you know, and I was questioning myself, you know, you're writing this, you don't know anything about it. <laughs> but I was questioning myself. But at that time, I said, look, I can teach principles. In this context, I can explain principles from the Word of God and just put down some practical guidelines for the young people to follow, right? So there will be those situations, but the norm is do and then teach. Doing precedes teaching. That was a little side example. If you don't want to just you can leave it, it was free. Now, let's get in now to talk about how to mentor, coach, and nurture people. How do you do this? And what we want to do, what we're going to do, is we're going to use Paul and Timothy as a case study here. Okay? We look at Paul and Timothy as a case study. Now, the apostle Paul, the great apostle Paul, when he began his ministry, 
uh, he set out to nurture or nurturing many young people. And this was so important because in AD 68, when the Apostle Paul was martyred under Nero, the Emperor Nero, when he was killed, beheaded, they thought they had finished with the Christian faith. But before he was killed, he had already raised up so many young people. He had already raised up. So they did away with Paul, but there were so many others whom he had already trained, and the work just continued. So what Paul did in nurturing young people was so strategic, was so very important for the life, for the very existence of the Christian church. And we know some important names like Timothy and Titus, but there were many other names, many of the young men whose names are given. You, know, you can read it this, this in Acts, the 20th chapter, the fourth verse. You'll find the names of many of the young people from different regions whom Paul personally, he spent three years with them in Ephesus, nurturing them, training them. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometime later he was going to be killed, but he did all this. He nurtured many young people. And, of course, he had many fellow workers, many people who worked with him, whom he also trained in the ministry. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this relationship between Paul and Timothy, look at these seven key points in the same framework, and see how it actually worked out with Paul and Timothy. Are you with me? Yes? Okay. So some background. Paul and Barnabas, this is going back in time to about A.D. 44 to A.D. 46. This was the time Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey. They, they, they left from their home church, the church in Antioch, which in today is in modern-day Syria, north of Israel. They live from Antioch. They, they travel across the Mediterranean. They come into what today is south, southern part, south-central Turkey. Um, in Bible times, it was known, the region was known as Galatia, the district of Galatia. And there were three main cities there, the city of Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And they were, it was like the tri-city area. They were all close to each other within about 300 miles. And so Paul and Barnabas, they come into this region, preaching the gospel, bringing the gospel there for the very first time. They're bringing the message of Jesus Christ. And there are several people who get saved. Among them are two women. One was Lois, an elderly woman, and her daughter Eunice. They are Jewish people. They come to faith. Now Eunice is married to a man who is Greek. And, we, and they come to faith in Christ during that first missionary journey. Time passes. Now, Eunice has a son whose name is Timothy. Uh, there is no record of when Timothy actually came to faith in Christ. But about six years later, Paul and Silas are going on their second missionary journey. And they come back to the same, they come back to the same area, to Iconium, Lystra, Derby and Lystra. And this time, Paul meets a young man named Timothy. Timothy is the son of Eunice. So somewhere along the way, he must have come to faith in Christ, been disciple. And uh, so Timothy, his mother is Jewish, his father is Greek, and Paul comes and he gets to meet this young man. So we, you're with me so far? All right, so let's pick up this story now. Acts chapter 16, number verses 1 to 3. So the first point we're talking about is selection. How does Paul select Timothy? Acts 16, 1 to 3. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, and his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted him to go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. So, imagine this in your minds. Paul comes to this place, Lystra, all the believers are there, Paul sees all of them, and there are a lot of young men who are in the faith. But Paul somehow fixes his eyes on this man called, this young man called Timothy. Now, Timothy at that time must have been about 17 years of age. And Paul gets, feels like, there's something about this young man. I want him to be part of my team. And he actually invites Timothy. He says, Timothy, come, be a part of my team. So, again, 
out of all the people there, Paul chooses Timothy. So point number one, selection. So this whole mentoring thing, this is a two-way thing, of course, that you select the people you're going to work with. Whom are you going to mentor? You cannot mentor everybody. And so you, you, you have to be judicious about your choice. Whom are you going to invest in? Whom are you going to pour yourself into? The same thing works the other way. As a mentee, you choose whom you would like to pour into your life. I'm sure Timothy had a choice to make. Should I say okay to Paul? Or should I say bye-bye, Paul? You're on your own. You know, he had a choice. He could have gone along. He could say no. Later on in 2 Timothy chapter 2, this last episode, Paul advises Timothy. He says, Timothy, the things you've learned from me, I want you to commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So you see a threefold criteria here. Now he's telling Timothy, what you've learned from me, I want you to pass it on. But whom do you pass it on to? Faithful people. Number one. So this is a heart issue. Are they sincere, faithful? It's a heart thing. Faithful people. Second, they should be able. This is a capability issue. Really have the capacity, the capability. Right? So you're pouring into potential. You're not pouring into something that's not there. You're pouring into potential. Do they, are they able? And third, there's a multiplication issue. Are they going to pass it on to others? In other words, this is not a wasted investment. This is investment is going to multiply. So you see a threefold criteria. Are you with me? So as you're choosing people, of course you're going to pray, but God will connect you. Hey, put it in that. You, I want you to invest in that person. I want you to invest in that person. But you're looking for these three, three things. You're looking for their heart. Is their heart in the right place? Second, you're looking for their capability. Can they really do this? And third, are they going to pass it on? They shouldn't be just a reservoir. They just accumulate things and don't give it to anybody. There should be a river. If I pour in them, they're going to pass it on. Are you with me so far? I remember way back in that same college days, as I was about to transition out, and you know, I decided on this young man uh, who was going to take over from me. I was spending time with him. One of the problems people had was, uh, in those days, he used to stammer. So can you imagine? I was telling them, this young man is going to take over from me. And the times I had him speak, he used to stammer. And so many people said, I don't think it's the right choice. But you know, after he took on the leadership, everything, the stammering disappeared. God took care of that. God took care of it. But there was a little step of faith. And, and if you ask me, why did you choose somebody who was stammering to be a leader of a, you know, a fellowship? Because I was seeing his heart. I was seeing his I knew something was in his heart that was just so right. Stammering doesn't matter. God will work that out. And God surely did. Yeah. So look at the heart first. If, he's, if that person's got the right heart, you go with it. Heart first. Second, the ability. Third, the multiplication. Is this going to multiply, right? So you may select choose people. Now, also remember this. You know, some practical things as you're going to invest in people's lives. You know, uh, uh, the heart is so important. The motivation. And I'm just sharing these things not to put anybody down, not to be critical, but I'm just sharing these things. Sometimes I've noticed, and especially when other pastors call me and say, Pastor, we want to mentor you and all of that. I've had so many different experiences. And one very important thing I ask at the very beginning or I think about the very beginning is motivation. Why is that person asking? What I've observed, and this is an observation, so don't get angry with me for telling the truth. Sometimes people just want a label. They just want to go around saying, so-and-so is my mentor. Because how do I know that? Because when I take it forward to the next step, I say, okay, what do you want to do? What do you want to be mentored in? What shall we work on these areas? There's absolute silence. They only want the label. So they can tell people, so-and-so is my mentor. They're not interested in the actual process. That's one kind of motivation I've noticed. Second, I tell them, you know, look, why don't we just be friends first, especially when, you know, I get a call from people whom I don't know so well. Why don't we just be friends first and then we'll think about the mentoring. Let's build a relationship. 
silence. That means they're not willing to invest. They don't understand. Relationship is so important for mentoring. They just want the label. So they can say, so-and-so is my mentor, but I'm not willing to invest in the relationship. I'm not willing to pay the price to be mentored. So then I know motivation is not there. They just want the label. And so in those cases, I don't even take it forward. I, I, sometimes I even just tell them, please don't call me your mentor. Because they just misuse all of this thing. So just do, don't call me your mentor. Sometimes it's other reasons, like you know, finances and those kinds of things. So I, I'm speaking from experience. So you need to make sure when people come to you and say, can you be my mentor? Their heart should be right. There are people who are genuine. They're very sincere. Then when you pour into their lives, it's such a great delight. Are you with me? But check the motivation first. The same thing works the other way. But if somebody comes and tells you as a mentor, I like to mentor you. Check their motivation. Why are they wanting to mentor you? Sometimes people are looking for a head count. They've done 500. You're number 501. So they're only thinking about increasing the headcount. They can say, I have mentored 500 people, and you are 501. <laughs> but if that's the motivation, say, no, thank you. You don't have to say yes. Why is it that they want to pour in, supposedly mentor you? Is their motivation right? It works both ways. Are you listening? Right? So think about these things. Another important thing to understand in, in, in while you're being a mentor is you are not an answer to everything in their lives. Meaning, very practical. If, example, if you are an electrician, would you go to a car mechanic and say, can you mentor me to be an electrician? No. You'd go to an electrician. No. A car mechanic can talk to you in general terms, how to handle people and how to handle customers and how to do, handle difficult situations. But when it comes to the specifics of your work as an electrician, you have to be mentored by somebody who knows that. In other words, mentoring means you know what you're talking about. Or as a mentee, you make sure that the person who's mentoring knows or has expertise in the area in which you want to grow. Are you listening? Otherwise, it's, it's pointless, right? So, when you're going to mentor somebody, make sure you've got the stuff to give. If you don't have stuff to give, just say, I'm sorry, I cannot do this because I don't have the knowledge or I don't have the learning in this area. It's better you go to somebody else. I don't have to be your savior. There are a lot of other people that God can use for you. Right? It means know your own limits. You're not alpha and omega, the Lord is. Amen? So as a mentor, know where your limits are. What can you add value to in that person's life? And as a mentee, also understand, go, don't talk to a mechanic to teach you how to be an electrician. That's being a little silly. Are you understanding? Making sense? No? Yes? Right? So simple things, right? In making this choice. And so therefore, when you're mentoring people, understand that uh, one individual may have multiple mentors. Now, especially in the Christian circles, especially in pastors, pastors say, I only, I, you have to drink only from this fountain. That's being stupid. Sorry for using that word on the pulpit. You know, God is the only one who's all the, you know, all encompassing, not the pastor. There is no preacher, there is no single ministry that has everything. No. So the point is, you've got to drink from many fountains. Are you understanding? So, when you're mentoring somebody, give your mentee the liberty to have multiple mentors because they need pouring in from, on different areas of their lives. And you can't do that for all. But I've heard pastors, I've heard people, you know, these great apostles and prophets who will say, oh, you only have to drink from my stream. And I've seen this thing written down in their thing. I said, how silly this is. But so many thousands of people fall for that lie. They say, I only drink from this stream. What happened? You think God has only one stream? Now, the Holy Spirit flows in many rivers. Are you listening? So don't fall for those lies. You know, don't, because that's just an, another way of controlling your life. That's just another form of control, especially in spiritual context. So drink from all the fountains through which you... God is pouring up 
right? You, there are, you need more than one mentor in different areas of your life who can build you up, strengthen you, and so on. So, as we continue looking at this, you know, there's obviously this dynamic that took place between Paul and Timothy for them to connect. There was a wonderful connection. But notice what Paul did. Paul took Timothy and had him circumcised. Are you still with me? We are still in Acts 16. Paul took Timothy and he had him circumcised. Now, it's very interesting. It's a big deal because the apostle Paul would write an entire epistle called Galatians to the same community, the same people, and tell them why they don't need to be circumcised. To the same people. He writes in a big episode and tell them, you guys don't need to be circumcised. And look what he's doing. He's taking one of them, and the first thing he does is he gets him circumcised. Hey, you're contradicting yourself. Now, Paul is being very practical. In this particular case of Timothy, his mother is Jew, his father is Greek. And being a Greek father, he would not have circumcised his son. But the, in the Jewish tradition, what the mother carried was so important. And so in, in an honor to her Jewish tradition, he had him circumcised. Plus, there was another strategic reason. Only if you're circumcised can you go and minister to the Jews. Only if you're circumcised can you enter the synagogue. It's a very practical reason. Are you listening? Some of you. Very practical. So Paul is theologically, he's against circumcision. But now we're, we're talking practical. He wrote an entire epistle, Galatians, read it. He's telling the same people, don't get circumcised. You don't need to become a Jew to a Christian. You can from Gentile be straight Christian. Or from Jew become a Christian. But he does something. Why? Being practical. So that's the second point. When you're working in this whole selection and working with your mentee, yes, even if you're doing spiritual things, be practical. And I'm saying this because I've seen, you know, in spiritual mentoring, so many times people are so silly in the kind of counsel, the kind of mentoring that happens. And especially, you know, we've seen this so often. Pastors say, they'll find a young man in the church who loves the Lord, who wants to serve God. What does the pastor say? Leave everything and come. I'll, I'll take care of you. So they tell him, leave your studies, leave everything, come. So this young man, happily, he jumps. Quit school. Stop studying. What are you doing? Pastor is mentoring me. What does pastor do? Morning, go to the grocery, buy vegetables. Send my children to school. Bring the newspaper. Mentoring is happening. I'm not joking. This is what happens. Pastor is using this man as... To do all his errands, I'm mentoring him. And pastor's not thinking that one day, this young man, he's got to get married. He's got to have a family. Who'll pay his bills? If he doesn't have an education, we'll give him a job. Pastor's not thinking about all that. So just you come, we'll serve Jesus. Are you listening? Got to be practical. Hey, this man has to have a future. Send him to, you know, get him to study, get him to get educated, give him a good future. While you are building him up spiritually, give him a good future. You know, he has to have a family, he has a home, he has to have children. He's got he's to be taken care of. We can't just say, leave everything and come. And then use him for all these errands that you want done. But because I see this happen over and over again. Running to these pastors around the country, and, and, and I see all these people following him. I say, what's happening here? And you hear this story, and you know, oh, same thing happening. Again? And again and again. They're not thinking about that person's future. But here you see T Paul is thinking about Timothy's future. He's doing something very practical for his future. Amen? So, make sure you take care of this. Right? Number two. The next thing we see here is opportunity. So, Paul creates this opportunity for Timothy. Timothy, come and be a part of this team. And you can just imagine the 17 year old going to his mama and saying, Mama, Paul, Apostle Paul, wants me to join his team. What should I do? Yeah. Mom says, This doesn't happen to everybody. <laughs> He's called you. This is a very special thing. Think about it seriously. Huh? So, this is an opportunity. Paul has created for Timothy, come with me. 
come. And Timothy steps in. And he is able to serve with them. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 22, he says, you know, uh, you know his proven character, that the son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. He served with me. He was with me. He was working with me. An opportunity created for Timothy to work with Paul. So you and I can create uh, opportunities. You know, sometimes you can say, hey, let's meet once a week. You're giving an opportunity. You're, you're creating space in your schedule, your time. Once a week we'll meet. I'll share with you what I have. You're creating an opportunity. And many times when I'm working with people, I'll, when I say you come and meet me, the agenda is you come with your questions. I'm not going to talk. You're going to ask questions. In other words, you come to take to draw from me. Now and then I might say things and I might steer the conversation somewhere, but this one hour is for you. You ask your questions. That's mentoring, meaning I'm giving you the opportunity to ask whatever you want. Because that, is, that approach is so much better. If I were a hose, hose, or, you know, just pouring water on you, but if the person was dead as a rock, all wasted. But if the other way, if the person was like a sponge, even if there was a little trickle coming out of me, they will take in everything. So that approach is so much better. That you let them be like a sponge. You ask the questions. What do you want to learn about? What do you want to know about ministry? Or what do you want to know about doing the work of God? You ask the questions. I'm here for you. You're creating opportunity. Are you listening? It's not about me telling you everything. Of course, we'll steer the conversations I'll share with you. But when you ask, you're drawing, you're pulling, you're soaking in, you're being like a sponge punch and you're taking things in so you create opportunities you create opportunities for them to uh, exercise the gifts travel with you so if you look at Timothy Timothy had this wonderful privilege of being with Paul for almost 16 to 18 years from AD 52 till about AD 68 so that's about 16 years or so so he had this wonderful opportunity to be with Paul and learn from him the third thing we see in Paul and Timothy, and which we can talk about in the, uh, the whole mentoring process, make the objectives very clear. So I'm sure that when Paul said, Timothy, come along with me, Timothy must have been thinking, wow, I'm going to go with Paul. Imagine all the flights, Lufthansa. <laughs> Imagine all the places I get to go with Paul. All these cities I'm going to see, and all the sites. Paul would tell Timothy, Timothy, you're coming with me. But one day you are going to be preaching. One day you are going to be planting churches. One day you are going to be doing the work of the ministry. This is not a picnic. Timothy, are you okay? <laughs> you know, meaning this is not a free flight. You've got work to do. The objectives are very clear. And you can see that come out in the, the epistles that Paul wrote to Timothy in First and Second Timothy. You know, it comes up very clearly. Timothy, you are a man of God. You've got to do the work of the ministry. You've got to endure hardships. All of that comes out there. Meaning, these are things he has spoken to Timothy and trained him on. So the objectives are very clear. So when you are beginning to work with people, make the objectives very clear. Example, if you're a coach and, and you know, you've got this athlete comes to you, 400 meters, and says, Coach, can you coach me? Sure. What do, you want to do? what do you want to accomplish? Okay, right now I'm doing 400 meters at around 55 seconds. I want to trim it down to 52. Okay, so your goal is very clear. You want to cut down your time by three seconds. Fine. But in order to do that, I'm going to put you, to the, put you through strength training every day, six days a week. There's going to be stamina building every day, six days a week. I'm going to adjust your schedule. You cannot eat ice cream, lollipops, popcorn. No. <laughs> Work, I mean, I'm going to work on your diet, no more ice creams, and, no, and, and I'm going to work on your mental health. Are you ready for it? You want to cut off three seconds? Here's the price. Are you ready? Only then the coach takes you. In other words, you want to be trained, we've got objectives, you want me to be your coach, here's how it's going to happen. Are you with me? So, the same thing, make your objectives clear. This is what we're going to work towards. This is what it's going to take to get there. Are you ready to make the journey? Make those objectives clear as you're working with people. Number four, 
Now for the mentoring process. The mentoring process. How did t- Paul work with Timothy? How did he work with him over that 16 to 18 year, years that, that Timothy came alongside Paul? What actually happened? Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. Bring it out very beautifully. And I love these verses. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. Let's read this together out loud. Let's go. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. What is Paul telling Timothy? Now remember, this is the last letter Paul is writing. This is towards the end of the 16 years Paul is writing to Timothy. And he's saying, Timothy, and I'm paraphrasing this, for 16 years, or maybe for 18 years, whatever that time was, you have closely seen, closely observed my teaching, my manner of life, my lifestyle. You've seen my purpose, how I lived with purpose. I wasn't just floating here and there. You've seen my love, my faith, my endurance, even my sufferings. You've seen it all. Are you listening? So what happened that 16 years? Timothy got to see. He got to listen. Of course, he got to participate in that. But this was how mentoring took place. He could see. This is the Apostle Paul. He was there with Paul when he was beaten. When he was whipped. When he was hungry. When he was shipwrecked, he was there. He would have seen Paul and he says, man, I'm so tired. Man, I'm so upset. And I've seen Paul in all of that. He has closely observed my manner of life. So, the mentoring process involves this. Especially in spiritual things. Let people see you for who you really are. Let them see you in everyday life. Let them see you in hard situations. How do you act and react? Let them see you mess up. You don't have to pretend you're perfect. Hey, I messed up. When our church staff know, (laughs) I mess up. They know. So, let them see you the way you are. The things you do. How you handle things. Your own struggles. So Paul says, Timothy, you have carefully, you've seen my life. You've heard my teaching, but you've also seen my manner of life. Are you with me? See, you can't live in a crystal cathedral somewhere way up there, descend down on Sunday morning, preach a message, and then disappear into your crystal cathedral the rest of the week. No. No then people are not going to see you. Are you listening? They got to see you. Monday through Friday. What are you doing? How are you working? How do you handle difficult situations? How do you navigate through life? See. So, as you're working with people, bring them close. Let them see. Be transparent. Share your life with them. Be authentic. Communicate openly. Tell them where you succeeded, where you failed, what you did right, what you did wrong. Coach, but do not dictate. That means teach them how to think through the situation. So if one of your people come and say, hey, uh, this is the problem. How do I handle it? Don't say two plus two is equal to four. No, let's break it down. How many, how many are there in two? One. One. How many are there in two? One. One. So how many do you have now? Four. What's the answer? Four. Now let's break them. Help them to think through rather than you saying the answer is four. So you ask them, what are your options? So these are, what are the outcomes of each option? Okay, these are the, so which option is the best? This one. So go with that. Okay. So what have you done? 
you've taught them how to think through the situation rather than just fixing the situation for them. Are you with me? Yes or no? Right. So coach people, teach them how to solve, find solutions. You also have to address problem areas in this mentoring process. That means, you see, most people, they will hide behind their niceties. Hello, pastor. Thank you, pastor. You are such a good pastor. Well, but the shepherd has a rod. Right? That means they say, okay, enough of the nice cities. Let's talk the issues. Right? So that's where in, when you're mentoring, working with people, you put away all the nice cities and say, guys, let's deal with the problem. What are the problems in your life that we need to deal with? We need to talk about. Sometimes people hide behind the successes. They'll always come and tell you, oh, Pastor, this wonderful thing happened. This wonderful thing happened. They will hide behind the successes. They will hide their own problems. They'll hide their own weaknesses behind the successes. So you've got to say, hey, let's put the success away. It's good. Good job. But let's talk about the issues. So you need to know how to have difficult conversations when you're working with people, mentoring. And as part of this, you need to bring correction. Say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. That's not the right thing. This is the right thing. You're correcting love, but you have to correct. You've got to tell it to their face. And sometimes some of us are so thick-skinned, it needs to, takes a little bit of effort to get in. <laughs> so you've got to tell them, this is wrong. What you're doing is wrong. And I've done that to our church staff. Some of them have stuck around 15 years. <laughs> but... It is. You've got to tell, this is wrong. It's not right. It's not acceptable. So you tell them, yeah. But how people handle correction it will tell you what stuff they're made of. Sometimes, and the good thing is sometimes people receive correction, and those are the kind of people you need to work with. Sometimes people get hurt. Oh, you hurt me so much. Well, I told you the truth. And the truth hurts. But the truth is good for you. The same truth that hurts you can also set you free. Depends on how you receive it. So, sometimes people get hurt. Sometimes people retaliate. Sometimes people just quit. I can't take this anymore. And sometimes there is passive quitting. They don't tell you they quit, but they actually quit. And they pretend they're still there. So you've got all kinds of reactions to correction. But you've got to correct. You've got to do it. Are you listening? You're doing it in love. You're doing it for their good. To build them up. So the mentoring, that's the mentoring process. A lot of things are involved. Number five. The next thing you see that the Apostle Paul does for Timothy is he delegates. So there comes a time when Paul starts sending Timothy on assignments. He sends him out to Thessalonica, to Macedonia, to Corinth, to Philippi. He sends, Timothy, you go. See what's happening in these churches and come back. Fix the problems, come back. So that's delegation. So there comes a time when you tell people, you know, now it's time for you to go out and do it. And the nice thing that you can see is that when Paul sends Timothy out to all of these places, he puts his rubber stamp on him. He endorses him wholeheartedly. To the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2, he says, I'm sending, verse 2, I'm sending Timothy, our brother, minister of God, and fellow laborer. You see how he's commending Timothy. He's my brother. Hey, Paul's brother has come. <laughs> he's my brother. He's my fellow worker. He's my minister. Of, he's a minister of God. To the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, he says, you know, Timothy will remind you of my ways. People say, if you want to listen to Paul, we don't want to listen to Timothy. But Paul is saying, hey, Timothy will remind you of my ways. I was better listen to him. Whatever he's saying is what I'll say. To the Philippians, he says this. In Philippians 2, he says, just, just look at the endorsement Paul is giving to Timothy. He says, I'm sending Timothy to you shortly. 
Verse 20, I have no one like-minded. In other words, man, this guy is it. He thinks like me. He's like-minded. And I, he, he, sincere, he will sincerely care for you. Verse 21, all seek their own, but not, and not the things of Christ. Verse 22, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. He's saying, look, I can vouch for his character. He served with me in the gospel. What an endorsement. So when Paul delegates Timothy and sends him out, he backs him up 100% in all of these churches. And what more? This is a great honor. In several episodes, Paul mentions Timothy as a co-author. He says, this epistle is from Paul and Timothy. Now many of you, if you're doing research, you like to have your name as a co-author on that publication. Timothy got it. He became a co-author in many of these episodes. Paul mentions him. What an honor. On 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians, he mentions him as a co-author. Number six, Paul challenges Timothy. He challenges him to do the work of the Lord like he did. 1 Corinthians 16, 10. He says, Timothy, I'm sending you, but you've got to do the work of the Lord like me. Not less than me. You've got to do the work of the Lord as I do. That's a tall order, but that's a challenge Timothy had to take up. Romans 16, 21, he says, you're my fellow worker. To the Romans, he says, Timothy is my fellow worker. He's my co-worker. He does the ministry like I do. And so he challenged Timothy. And, and this is, again, something we've got to do. As we are mentoring people, challenge them. Growth means stretching and stretching is usually painful, and nobody likes it. But you've got to make people uncomfortable. You've got to stretch them. You've got to push them and say, look, I want you to do this. I want you to take this up. I want you to go for it. They may hesitate. They may feel scared. But you're there to build them up, and so you challenge them. Go do it. And lastly, Paul commissions Timothy. Number seven. We now come to about AD 64 when Paul has been under house arrest in Rome for two years and then he's briefly released. And during this time of release, he goes back uh, to the island of Crete. He appoints Titus to take care of the church there. He goes to Ephesians and then he says, Timothy, I'm putting you as the person in charge of this church in Ephesians. And then he makes his journey back to Rome. On the way back to Rome, he writes Titus. First Timothy, from Rome he writes Second Timothy. So he has commissioned Timothy. He says, Timothy, this is it. You're going to be the ch in charge of this church here. Take care of it. And he goes back. From Rome he writes, in his final words he writes to Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 4. He says, Timothy, if possible, come to me in Rome before winter. And I've left some things in Troas. I want you to bring them with me when you come. We don't know if Timothy got to get there to Paul in Rome. We don't know. Maybe he did. And if he did, he may have been there to see Paul beheaded, A.D. 68. And he goes back. Timothy goes back to Ephesus. He continues as the bishop of Ephesus till A.D. 97. So he has a good tenure, about 30 years taking care of that church. And history has it that Timothy himself was imprisoned, put in prison. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, mentions him coming out of prison. So sometime in his ministry, Timothy spent time in prison. Comes out of it. He continues as a bishop in Ephesus. And somewhere around AD 97, Timothy himself is martyred for the gospel at Ephesus. The people in Ephesus kill him for his preaching of the gospel. It's a tremendous story, a tremendous life that was raised up with a great impact for the kingdom of God. Now, not all mentoring will turn out good. Jesus had 12. One of them didn't make it. Paul mentions some people who didn't make it. Demas is one of them. 
He was a co-worker with Paul, but he deserted Paul, left the ministry. We don't know if he departed from the faith, went away. So there will be these exceptions, but the norm, the wonderful thing is when we invest in people's lives, it's beautiful to see the, fr the fruit their life bears for the kingdom of God. The life that they live, the mark that they leave on history for the kingdom of God. And you've had a part to play in what comes out of their lives. Amen? So think about these seven steps. Worship team, please come. Think about these seven key points here in this framework. Just to quickly review, there is selection, there's opportunity, there are objectives that are stated, there's a mentoring that happens, there's a delegation, there's a challenge, there's the commission. And we're just grateful to God for all the people who've been raised up here at ABC over the years, who've been raised up, nurtured. Many of them, as I mentioned last week, have gone to various parts of the world. But it's an honor to be able to see people rise up and be powerful for the kingdom of God. Amen? And may each of you do the same. May each of you raise up other people who will be powerful for God's kingdom. Let's rise to our feet, please. This morning, I just want to want you to pray and say, God, use my life for God, for your kingdom. Use my life. It doesn't matter what your age is, young or old, it doesn't matter. God can use you. God can work in you. God can do amazing things through you. So you just have to pray. Say, Lord, use my life for your kingdom. Help me to pour into somebody's life, maybe many people's lives. Help me to pour into them so they can be raised up. Send me as a Paul into Tim, some Timothys. Make me a blessing to some people to raise them up so that they can have impact for the kingdom. Let's take a few minutes to pray before we wrap things up. the glory and the honor Lord we lift our hands and worship as we lift your holy name you deserve the glory and the honor Lord we lift your hands as we lift your holy name for you are great you do miracles so great there is no one else like you there is no one else like you for you are great you do miracles so great there is 
Thank you, God. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, by the anointing, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I call forth, God, call forth the gifts and the grace and the anointing and the call and the commission that you've placed on each one here, God. That every person here, young or old, whatever age we may be, God, that whatever you've deposited in our lives and the call that you've placed on our lives, let it come forth, Father. And we pray that this house will be a place when men and women will be raised up to fulfill their call. Men and women will be nurtured and trained and equipped and mentored and discipled and poured into so that they can be powerful for your kingdom, Father. In which of a sphere of influence, in which of a sphere of society, God, that you'll raise up powerful men and women to impact our city, to impact our nation, to impact nations of this world. And Father, today, by the power of your Holy Spirit, let destinies be birthed. Let destinies come forth. Let the call of God emerge. Let there be a stirring up inside our spirits, inside of our hearts, of the very call of God on our lives, Father. And give us the wisdom to know how we can be equipped, how we can be mentored and nurtured and poured into so that each one of us can rise up to the full measure of the call and the destiny that you placed on our lives. Let there be no person here who falls short of the great things and the good things that you have upon them to do here on earth. Let not a single one of us fall short of all that you have kept stored for us, Father. May each one of us rise up into it, fulfill it, May each one of us be thoroughly equipped by a word, by a spirit, and by being poured into, by being nurtured, by being encouraged to be all you've called us to be. May each one of us be bold and be courageous to step in to the call, to step in to what God wants us to do. May each one step in, Father. May we be bold. May we be fearless to do what you've called us to do. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. Just take a moment to pray and say, God, use me. Use me, God, for your kingdom. Make me bold, make me fearless, make me courageous. Pour into my life, God. Fill me up so that I can pour out to others. Be a blessing to others. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to just speak the benediction. We will close. After that, our pastors, those of our pastoral team, those of you here, please make yourself available so that we can pray for people. If you need prayer, you need ministry, you're most welcome to come to any one of us and we'll be happy to pray with you, minister to you. 
Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.